The moment I left high school, that's when the partying started. Did that create any kind of friction between you and your dad? You're being serious? That's your first question? Is there any reason why you don't talk a lot about your mother? Pat's gonna end up being a drug dealer. I don't like his friends. And a lot of times she had a valid reason. But... Did you ever at any point struggle with any kind of addictions? It's not good when your friends are on shrooms and he gave me half a pill of ecstasy. Why is this unicorn chasing me? And my buddy's like, that's a tree, it's not a unicorn. Who were you in high school? I'm a pen pal to my health and guidance teacher. She'll tell me, here's what's going on with my chickens. What's the story between these semi-naked pictures that you have online? Chatsworth at the time produced 80% of all the porn around the world. Where is this going? I decided to play ball and I wanted to be in the arena and this comes with this. How is it being married to somebody like you? We've never had a conflict working with each other except for the first week, we went through this tornado. Is this still the focus to be the number one channel on YouTube for entrepreneurs? Or are you trying to be the number one channel on YouTube for mobsters or bodybuilding? There is a strategy to the madness of that attainment. This is gonna sound weird. I see a lot of me and you. That's all I can tell you. Good luck to you. I was a very good dancer, if that's what you wanna know. Did you ever think you were making it? I feel I'm so close, I could take sweet victory. I know this life meant for me. Yeah, why would you bet on Goliath when we got bet David? Value payment, giving values contagious. This world of entrepreneurs, we get no value to hate it. How they run, homie, look what I become. I'm the, I'm the one. So today's guest, uh, I have a uh, love-hate relationship with him. I think I've probably had the most arguments and debates with today's guest. I don't know why it is. It just seems like every time we talk, it leads to a, a lot of friction. But today, I'm hoping we can have a civil conversation together. With that being said, my guest today is the host of Valuetainment, as well as the COPHP agency, Patrick Bedebe. Patrick, thanks for making the time to be a guest today on Valuetainment. It's good to be here. So, look, Patrick, obviously a lot of people already know uh, quite a lot about your background, whether it's your uh, parents, Iran, growing up, military, divorce, all of that stuff. I want to ask some questions that maybe we've never touched up on before or it's new to you. Is that okay with you? That's fine. Yeah. So let's start off with the first question. Look, I mean, I've heard a lot of rumors that uh, you used to dance a lot, you know, nightclubs, you know, dancing was like a big part of your game back in the days when you were younger. What is the story with you being a dancer? Were you a dancer before? What do you mean dancer? Like, did you ever dance? Like, did you ever get paid to dance? Was there any kind of elements of you dancing at nightclubs? That's your first question? I mean, like I said, I'm gonna ask you some questions that we've not asked before. So yes, that's, that's, uh, that's my first question. I was a very good dancer, if that's what you wanna know. That's really your first question, though. Fair enough, fair enough. So we, look. The topic of your dad comes up a lot. You're always talking about your dad. Growing up, I know there was some time where you talk about your dad wasn't in the picture, you know, where you were, either you were in Germany or something like that. Did that create any kind of friction between you and your dad? That's a great question. I think at one point I was a little bit uh, resentful, probably when I was in Germany and I didn't get a chance to see him for two years. You gotta realize, my dad and I, I mean, I've never had a bad relationship with my dad, aside from me getting out of the military maybe for the first month or two because he was trying to kind of get me to be the 14-year-old kid, which wouldn't work. But I've never had a bad relationship with him. I was resentful for not seeing him for two years because I just loved his company so much. But uh, yeah, no, my dad and I have had a great relationship pretty much from day one. He always used to tell me, he would say, you know, the reason why I'm tough on you is because one day I want us to be best friends for the rest of our lives. And he is my number one best friend in my life today. So I'm curious, when you were living in Iran, was your dad talking to you about the political climate in Iran? Was that conversation taking place or he wasn't really talking much politics with you? We never talked about politics. I had no idea what was going on. His method to the madness was to not uh, make it seem like anything is a big deal. It was always like, it's gonna be all right, it's gonna be fine, it's gonna go away. He, he wanted to calm uh, uh, the storm rather than add to the storm. It was almost like at this phase of your life, you don't need to spend too much time consuming your mind with this. You need to be a kid today and grow up and learn to be a better leader, but you don't need to know a lot about politics. That was my dad's approach to it. He kept a lot of the pressure away from us. Interesting. I'm curious, how does your dad feel about uh, your life right now? 
I mean, I'm sure he's proud. You know, he's, uh, he's said it many times, but uh, the relationship is a different re relationship today. You know, I told him a long time ago, you've done your part the first 25 years. From here on, it's on me. You just tell me what you want. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure this thing's going to be taken care of. And he's heard that from me. I don't know how many times. You talk a lot about your father, but we don't hear a lot about uh, your mother. Is there any reason why you don't talk a lot about your mother? My mom and I have a uh, different kind of a relationship than my dad. My mom was a warrior. Everything to her was, uh, she was always worried about bad things happening. Whether it was living in Iran with war, whether it was with us, Pat's gonna end up being a drug dealer. What if Pat ends up doing this? We, I don't like his friends. What if, I mean, a typical mom stuff that you worry about what your kids are gonna do. And a lot of times she had a valid reason because uh, uh, some of the people I was hanging around with were probably not the best people to hang around with. But, uh, but she would always say, she would say, you know, Pat, you can do whatever you wanna do. Anything you can do bad, if you do it, I may not find out but the man upstairs is watching everything you do. That visual really, you know, did a number on me because every time I wanted to do something that was uh, out of the ordinary, I'm like, well, mom's not gonna find out. Dad's not gonna find out. But you mean to tell me someone's watching me? Yeah, maybe I ought to think about not doing this. So she instilled different kind of mindsets. I will tell you this, there is no way in the world I am who I am today without my mom because my mom instilled the ability to read people you know, I watch body language with how my mom was constantly with her worries and concerns and how my dad was and how the relationships were. I got that part of it from her and she's a little bit more of a nitpicker than uh, most people are and I would say I'm a little bit of a nitpicker as well. But uh, yeah, my relation with my mom is very different than my relation with my dad. Based on that, what type of relationship would you want to have with your kids one day? Obviously, it's going to be slightly a different relationship with uh, me and my boys than I had with my father because they're going to have resources that my dad didn't have. Let me explain. My dad's job was to give us a better environment to go out there and spread our wings and whatever we're going to do with it, right? That was the whole idea about, hey, my mom and my dad, because my mom was more influential on us living, leaving Iran. If it wasn't up to my mom, we would probably be in Iran longer. My mom's like, we got to get out of here because he's going to serve. So, his, his purpose was to get us out where, and then what I'm going to do with my life, where my purpose, where my kids is, they have access to more resources. So it's about what they do with those resources and those contacts. They have a bigger upside than their daddy. You know, they have a bigger start than their daddy. But the friendship side, the relationship side, the leadership side, the expectation side, a lot of that's going to be similar. Since you have a daughter, I know you got two boys and you got a daughter, do you treat all your kids the same? Um, do I treat them all the same? No, I don't treat my daughter the same. Matter of fact, last night was a special night because uh, uh, la my girl and I have a very unique relationship. She loves her mommy. She's mommy's, she's team mommy 100%. But she's got a different connection with me. You know, when her and I go to, when I put her down and she wants to get close and, you know, I'm hugging her and, you know, we're spending that quality time together. It's a completely different feeling than my boys. So my daughter, I, I treat in a completely different way, but I will tell you this, she's a, she's a professional smack talker. I mean, she knows how to bring it. She knows how to poke. She knows how to instigate. Got it. She knows how to get what she wants. I don't know what's gonna happen with her, but she's either gonna be an attorney or she's gonna get what she wants because she's got a very, very, very strong personality at a young age but it's a completely different relationship I have with her than the boys. If there's one thing you do talk about, I don't know what it was on one of the interviews, you said something about reading people. You spend a lot of time talking about reading people. Do you think that's something that can be taught? I think anybody can learn how to be better in something, but there are certain things, no matter how much time you put into getting better at it, somebody else can get great at it. You know, I can learn how to hit a baseball and get pretty good at it. But I am never going to be able to get as good at hitting a baseball than like Ted Williams because he's had the 20-20 vision and, you know, the way he would see things and everything would slow down. That's, you can't do nothing about that, right? There are certain things I can do to get as good as somebody else's but never great. Reading people, a part of it has got to be the life you've lived because the more friction of a life you've lived where there's more controversy, more heated issues, more things you saw, more fights, you know, more challenges right in front of your eyes as a kid coming up, all of that is memory that's being stored here, and it stays, right? And when it stays here, later on in your life, when you see somebody that's behaving in a certain way, you say, oh, this reminds me of 28 years ago when 
that took place in very similar habits and it's very similar attitude and language. If that's the case, the next move he should make should be this. Oh my God, that's exactly what he did. Got it. So you go back to the inventory you've had. So to be able to read people is a byproduct of the life you've lived and a part of it has to do with who you are as an individual. Then a part of it is putting into practice and studying the skill. But yeah, that's what I would say. Wow, and you got interesting. Do you think someone can be book smart and be good at reading people or street smart? What, what do you think it is to be good at reading people? It's definitely an advantage. So think about it. A person that's got, uh, so, so say they face against each other. Street smart faces off against book smart, right? There's going to be places where the book smart has an advantage over the street smart, right? It's like the scene from, uh, what is that movie? Is it The Goodwill Hunting, right? Where, where he says, how about them apples? That one scene at the bar, he meets a book smart guy and he's quoting all this stuff from, you know, books and bragging about it to trying to get this girl's number. And then shows up Matt Damon, who's a kid from Boston, friends with Affleck, and he's a street smart guy and book smart. He annihilates this guy. So if this guy, there's one thing he can't pick up, you can't teach street smart to a person. If a person's raised in a very uh, uh, safe, peaceful environment with not a lot of conflicts, how are you gonna teach him street smart? Well, how are you gonna teach him that? That's, that part is not possible, right? But if you combine the two together, that's a very dangerous combination. You know, Pat, you regularly talk about hard work. You're always preaching hard work. You know, the whole outwork, out improve, out strategize, out last. Do you ever wish you worked less so you had more time to spend with your kids and your family? I don't think so. Let me explain to you why. Let me explain to you why. Selfishly, selfishly, there's nothing I enjoy more than to be around my kids. Selfishly. Selfishly, I would like my kids to not go to school and we get on a plane and we go travel places and we hang out together. Selfishly, I'd like to, you know, be with them 24-7 and hang out and go relax and go to movies and go to parks and play sport. I selfishly, I'd love to do that, right? But I have to go back and think about what is good for them? What is good for their lives? You know, I got 18 years with these guys that they're gonna be with me. After 18 years, they're gonna live on for their life. It is selfish of me to want to have them around me 24 seven and not teach them the habits that my dad taught me to be a good citizen, right? What is a good habit to learn to be a good citizen? A good habit to learn to be a good citizen is to be independent, is to lead, is to respect, is to improve, is to love, is to have courage, wisdom, tolerance, understanding, is to not get bullied and not bully people. And to do that, I woke up. Every day when I woke up, I'm like, where's dad? He was already gone to work. So for 10 years in my mind is, when you wake up, the man's gotta be gone to work. So you gotta go get to work, right? Okay. Then I would see my dad would come home and I would see him once a week on a Friday. In Iran, the Friday is U.S.'s Sunday, right? So he would come home on Friday. We'd wake up early. He would take us to the park. After the park, we'd go to church. After church, we'd go to grandma's house. Then we'd come home. Then he would have his two hours to take a nap. Then we'd watch it, uh, have dinner together. Then we'd have family time together, watch a movie, and we'd go to sleep. And I look forward to that one day together, right? So for me, I look at these kids and I think about, okay, I have all the resources in the world today where I can sit home and do nothing. I don't have to work at all. I can sit home and be around these guys for the rest of my life. But is that teaching them the habit they need to also go out and win in their lives when they're past 18? I don't think so. I think they're gonna go back and think about how their daddy was when they were younger to reflect on those memories and those habits and hopefully apply those things into their lives one day. That's interesting, uh, you sharing that. Did you ever at any point struggle with any kind of addictions? I don't know, maybe it's drugs or alcohol or anything else growing up. My struggle wasn't with uh, drinking. My struggle was probably with uh, partying and women and chasing skirts. That's probably was my addiction. I, I, just, I just liked it a lot and I, I, I enjoyed it. Like if I could do it every day, it was that hunt, that uh, excitement of somebody new, you know, the, 18 year old kid when a girl says there's no way in the world and you want him to see if you can figure out a way to get her to like you or be interested in you and what's the strategy you need to use to go about it. I was in that part, that phase for, for a good six, seven years. From 18 to 25, I was very committed. Did, did, did it work most of the time? Well, you know, the great thing about strategies is you can test them multiple times. You know, when you test these strategies, um, you think they're working, then they don't, then you make some adjustments, then you get better, then you're 
But the whole thing with strategies is it's never 100%. Strategies is all about increasing the percentage. It's not 100%. It may work one out of 10, and then you get better, it's two out of 10, then three out of 10, but it's never gonna be 10 out of 10. The idea is to make your strategies better. And as long as you're making your strategies better, whether, whether it's with you know, women, party, and business, money, finance, it doesn't matter. Everything's about improving your strategies. So that's the philosophy that I applied in every aspect of my life. We got a lot of single people on Value Tim. Is there any strategies you want to share with the rest of us that worked for you? So I'll give you two, two strategies. Here's what I'll tell you. One is if you're by yourself and you're going to a nightclub. And the other one is who you are going to the nightclub. It's very, very important what crew you go out with, okay? So let's first focus on you, then we'll give the crew. If it's you, okay, if it's you and you're going by yourself to a nightclub or a place that's going to have a lot of options there, make one round and on your one round compliment 20 different women in areas that they put a lot of time into. So complimenting them on what everyone's going to say, oh my gosh, you know, you got such a, you know, I love your body, I love your boot, all these, that, that line's not effective. Got it. Maybe for a certain community, but not effective for all communities. And it's been tested, by the way, many, many times. But you're telling a compliment on hair, because I took time to fix my hair. I love your eyebrows, because eyebrows, you got to put details into it. Hey, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm big on the right amount of makeup. I can tell you did the right amount of makeup. Your face, you look very, very good. It's got to be things that they're putting time into. Your toes, flawless. I got to tell you, I'm a toe. Your toes are flawless. Those things stick around. So when you go on the second round and you're coming back, now you got, by the way, you compliment and you move on. On the second round, you get a smile. Then when you get the smile, you say, can I get you a drink? If she's by herself, you get her a drink. There's 19 other girls that are looking at you saying nobody complimented them on that specific area. So this part, it's pretty proven. This is gonna help any single guy. If you can get to do this, you'll have a good time. You look forward to going to nightclubs. The other part is if you got a crew, uh, uh, this part with the crew is a completely different game plan. When you have a crew, I'm working for you. So for instance, I'm not flirting. I'm flirting for you, I'm not flirting for me. So We'd go to a club and, you know, you would say, I'd say, hey, uh, uh, who are the three girls here you like? And you'd say, the girl in the green. I said, who else? That one over there. Okay, who else? Okay, let me get to work. So then I'm going. And my language is very easy because my language is going to be, hey, look, uh, I got to tell you, I'm good. I got a girl, but my buddy here who's standing right over there thinks you're hot, cat bit his tongue. You know, he kind of wants to get to know you. I've been telling him to go, but he can't, you know, he's trying to face his fears. And would you mind if you and I go together with him and if I can make the introduction, would that be okay with you? Even if it's just a conversation. Oh yeah, okay, one out of three times, it worked. Mm, mm -hmm. So, and I didn't get rejected, right? So I go there, I make the pitch, I come back, I make the presentation, I make the connection. Then it's on you on what you're gonna do with the words. Cause now it's fully on you to be able to, you know, build a conversation and get him going. But those two strategies, if I tell you, if you were part of my crew, you're going to have a good time. That's all I can tell you. You had a great time. And, and by the way, there's a proven record of this. People, I had friends from high school who would fly into the military just to come and spend a week with me. They all went back wanting to come back to the military because we did this in a very effective fashion. I'm sure you uh, 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 made a lot of single guys happy with that strategy. Good luck to you. So you know how you often talk about Germany. How was, how was that experience for you? You know, when you lived at the refugee camp, is it good memories, bad memories? What was it like living in Germany at the refugee camp? Germany to me is, I mean, I can't wait to go back because it's, it's one of my fondest memories of my life. Everything about Germany was uh, good to me. I lived at a refugee camp and we got so close at this refugee camp. I learned so much about human nature because we had people there from Yugoslavia, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Poland, Russia, Czech Republic at the time, Albania, and all of us were together. So imagine living in a community together for a year and a half, and some are sent back, some stay, some leave, some get citizenship, some don't. You're seeing this whole hardship, and, and we got very, very close, very close, to the point where I have a relationship with some of them from the refugee camp, and I was in 89. I still have a relationship with some of the people till today. And then, you know, Germany was also part where my dad officially wasn't around me. So that's when I realized, now you don't have a father figure in your life. There was no dad in Germany, dad came straight to US. 
So I had to learn to man up very, very quickly in Germany. And I think that was an edge because I had to learn how to make money. I had to learn how to make friends. I had to learn how to fight. I had to learn how to defend myself. I had to learn how to defend my family. When our back's against the wall, you have the instinct to want to protect your family. You see, all the instincts are in here. It's pulling those instincts out. And sometimes to pull out the right instincts requires some travesty or crisis or challenges to go through. And when you don't have a father that's around you and your parents don't have money, you got to figure out a way to go out there and make the money. If Germany doesn't happen, I don't know if I have uh, 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 the, the experience and the toughness that I have today mm. because of living at that camp for two years. Really? But memories, incredible memories. So look, you know, every guest on Valley Timmy that's been interviewed, one of the common question is, who were you in high school? So having said that, who were you in high school? Who was I in high school? It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question. Who was I in high school? So in high school, I was actually not, the, I never had a girlfriend in high school, by the way. It's one thing most people don't know. I never had a girlfriend. I wasn't the, uh, uh, the ladies' man in high school. That came military, not in high school. So in high school, I was probably the guy that hung out and got along with everybody. I got along with the gangsters, I got along with the kids that were regular, middle, I got along with athletes, I got along with the cool guys, I got along with the nerds, I got along with the teachers for the most part, my outside of Miss Rose, who gave me a D in ceramics, uh, it made no sense to me when she gave me a D in ceramics. But uh, I got along almost with everybody. And till today, I'm, a, I'm a, one of my pen pals, I write, uh, a letter, I'm a pen pal to my health and guidance teacher till today, Miss Sinclair, her and I write letters to each other. I mean, she's the reason why I joined the Army, 14 years old, I'm 41, was 27 years ago, and we write letters. She'll tell me, here's what's going on with my chickens, because she's got chickens, you know, she's got, she loves animals, and she's got all this stuff that we go back and forth. But uh, I speak to my uh, math teacher, Mr. Woods, and he'll send Armenian messages to me, because he's a white guy that tries to speak Armenian, but in high school, I was a guy that lifted weights. I was a guy that had a good physique. I was a guy that worked out. I was a guy that was uh, obsessed with wanting to be Mr. Olympia. I was that guy uh, in high school. Didn't play organized sports. Wasn't a big GPA guy. I was a one point GPA guy. And uh, every time I went to school, I would sell something. And after high school, I was working at Hagen Dutch. So if, if it wasn't money or working or weight lifting or bodybuilding, there wasn't a lot in my life at that time. Let me ask you, did you consider yourself a pretty confident high school student? I think if you ask my friends if I was confident, they, they'll probably tell you uh, uh, there's an element of confidence and there's an element of worry, you know, an element of uh, I don't know if I'm going to make it out of this or not and I don't know what the future holds. But at the same time, one thing everybody will say is I was always a dreamer, mm -hmm. always. Mm -hmm. Everything was about, hey, you know, what do you want to do one day in your life? You got four options. Which one would you rather choose? Being a billionaire, being the best basketball player in the world, being the best performer in the world, or being the best actor in the world? Who would you want to be? And we'd have this conversation. Imagine if one day this happens to you, what would you do? So the dreaming component was always there. The confidence was always there. I was always concerned about my mom, my sister, who's my sister going to be dating, my dad's health. Those were my concerns at the time because the three people that mattered the most to me at that point in my life was my mom, my sister, and my dad. Those three, I thought about them a lot, and then it was everything else. So I know you said earlier you never really had any kind of a, a addictions as a, as a kid, or, you know, up to 18 in high school. Never, no. Did you ever have any experiences with drugs as an adult? I did, and I'll tell you each uh, 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 time when I did. So one time, I think we were at the Mayan, and my buddies, uh, I'm, you know, I'm combining uh, uh, alcohol and I'm combining beer and everything together, and it's after the army. And uh, one of my buddies says, here, uh, throw this uh, ecstasy, and he gave me half a pill of ecstasy. I have no idea uh, what uh, kind it was, but he gave me half a pill of ecstasy. And he gave it to me and I took it. And it had the worst reaction for me. We went to this uh, Jack in a Box right across the street from Conrad's in Glendale, and we parked the car in front of the tree. The tree looked like a unicorn chasing me. I mean, <laughs> it's like completely dumbfounded saying, why is this unicorn chasing me? And my buddy's like, that's a tree, it's not a unicorn. So it had a completely different reaction for me. And it's not good when your friends uh, uh, are on shrooms and, and they're trying everything and you're trying to kind of hold it together. So I don't even know if it was a unicorn or what it was, but I can tell you from that day, I said, don't ever you know, give me any kind of ecstasy. 
uh, and what's so funny is uh, one of my uh, uh, very good friends uh, was a guy that uh, was one of the biggest dealers of ecstasy in America. He sold probably 100,000 at a time. And uh, he was uh, uh, very good at what he did, one of the biggest partiers out there. And then I, I smoked pot, but if I smoked pot, it was uh, uh, a few times with a girl I was with is when I smoked pot. And the experience with pot was complete opposite. It was a very, very different experience. It just slowed me down, and I don't want to slow down. But it was something that made me think less, and I know some people get panicked and they start having the uh, paranoia when they're smoking weed. Complete opposite effect on me. But that was 21, 22, 23 years old. And then I used to be a bodyguard for two or three weeks for one of the biggest uh, uh, dealers in LA for cocaine. So a couple of times he said, you gotta see the product I got. I tried that, I said, this is the worst drug for me because I'm already here, you want me to do this? I'm gonna go here, not gonna happen. But outside of that, nothing else. You know, that, that was my experience. So uh, out of those three, I can tell you, the only one that may have a positive effect on me is probably weed. All the other ones, no effect, no positive effect. Awesome. <laughs> Definitely no positive effect. Definitely a negative effect. So that, that's kind of what my, how my body reacts to it. Uh, uh, let, me, let me ask you, have you ever experienced anybody like a friend or family losing the battle of addiction to any drugs yourself? When I speak on stage, I've, I've gotten emotional four times. When I speak on stage, four times I've gotten emotional to the point where I can't control myself. And I don't know, like, it really has gotten the uh, best of me. I think Mario's probably witnessed three of them uh, when he's see, seen this happen. And out of the four times that this has happened where it's been absolute losing control of emotions, three of them is because of a friend, uh, Armin. Armin was a, a very good friend. Armin was a very talented guy. I love the guy. I love him till today. I think about him till today. Hmm. He was a funny guy. He was a prank guy. He was a brilliant guy. He was a you know, fun guy to be around, business guy. You know, he wanted to make money, he wanted to do something, he wanted to make his parents proud. And uh, at the same time, he was chippy, he liked breaking the rules, and he got caught up on Vicodin, and Vicodin got the best of him. I took him to multiple different places, to rehabilitation centers, and we went all over the place. But when that day happened, when I got the call, I, I couldn't tell you, it's probably May 5th, 05, and that one really was a tough one. So yeah, I have lost friends to it, and that's one of them. I have a handful of stories like that. Another one is a recent one that happened that was over cocaine. And uh, it was uh, one of my very good friends who happened to also be one of our uh, leaders in the company who got caught up in that as well. That was painful. I went to Miami to the funeral. But I have a handful of those stories that are painful. But yes, I've seen it happen. And it's not fun, especially when it's a friend and a family member that that happens to. That's unbelievable. Wow. Let me ask you, how did you go about joining the Army? Is there a story behind it? So when I got out of high school, I went to one semester of Glendale Community College, and then I went to the Army. Uh, a week after my mom went back to Iran, she said, you have a couple of choices. You can come back to Iran with me or go stay here. I said, I'm going to stay here. I went to my sister. I said, let me live with you for a month. She said, no problem. I gave her my computer and paid her rent money. One day, I woke up after party until 4 o'clock in the morning with my friends downstairs at the sauna. And we were drinking heavily. I'm 18 years old at this time. And uh, this is when I started partying. Right the moment I left high school, that's when the partying started. And, uh, you know, that day for me when that happened, I woke up in the morning. I went downstairs to my car. My mom left me a Toyota Corolla 1983, and the car wasn't there. So I called the cops. I'm like, the car's not here. Is it stolen? Six months later, they contact me telling me the car was in Rosarita. So somebody stole the car and went straight to Mexico with the car. But then when they stole the car, I got a hangover. I don't feel like going to Glenlock Community College or going to my job at Burger King. I called my dad, I said, Dad, take me to the recruiting station in Glendale. We went to Glendale. My recruiter was Jesus Guerra. I said, Jesus, if you can get me to the, go to the Army tomorrow, I'll sign up right now. He says, I can't get you tomorrow. He says, it's gonna take 90 days. Says, I'm not signing up if it's 90 days. Two weeks later, I was in South Carolina and I went to the Army. It's the story. So when it comes down to your peers, if, if we were to talk to any of your peers from the Army, what identity did you have? Who were you amongst your peers? I was the leader of the group. That, that part is a, is a def, definite. It, it, it didn't matter if you were a sergeant or not. I was the leader of the group. If we went to the club, if we went to the gym, if a fight was to break out, if something were to happen, I think they would say I was the leader of the group. And I'm in contact with most of them. So if you were to talk to them, they'd probably tell you that as well. So if we were going to a club, we're going to go to the club that... Uh, 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 I had a mind that we wanted to go to. And it was typically a good move when I chose the club because we're gonna have a good time when we go to the club.
you know, typically for people who are in the military, they all have a lot of crazy stories. What were some of your craziest story of being in the Army? There's a lot of them that I don't want to share, but I'll give you one of them. I mean, uh, my buddy had a truck, an F-150 truck. You know, we wanted to get six guys with us to go to Panama City. Now, you got to realize the drive is a nine-hour drive, and you can only fit three people in the cabin. And we have clothes to take with us because a weekend in the military is called a Danza. Danza is a four-day weekend. They call it a Danza. Everybody wanted a Danza. So we get in the, uh, in the truck. I'm sitting in the truck, and my friend, and then uh, Jeff, who's driving the uh, truck, Bradford. But there was mm -hmm. three guys laying in the back. No padding, nothing. But because you wanted to go to Panama City to go to Club La Vila and Spinnakers, you were willing to make the sacrifice. And the best part about these trucks was when we were driving and there were bumps. Because when there's bumps, these guys are, you know, they're flying high. And it was probably not a safe thing to do, but you're in the military. You're not thinking a lot. And then one time we're going, we went through this uh, tornado and rain, which was great because all our clothes got wet. So by the time we got to Panama City, everyone's clothes is wet, all of it. And the guys in the back are sitting in a puddle for four or five hours going 70 miles an hour. And, uh, you know, fortunately nothing happened. Obviously, I don't advise that for, for anybody, although I know a lot of people will if you're in the military. But uh, that's one of the stories. But in the military, you're... You're not thinking a lot. It's just constantly trying to push the envelope in another thing, and it's everything's a dare. I dare you to do it. I thought you were tough. I thought you had it in you. I thought you called yourself a party guy. What was this all about? I am. Then if you are, get in the back of the truck. Let's go. It was, it's constantly trying to challenge you. And, uh, you know, if you didn't take the challenge, then you're going to be for a whole week called out for being a pansy for not wanting to take up the challenge. So you're either going to take the challenge, and if you don't, you're going to hear it from everybody for a week. So you almost have to say, no, I'll get in the back of the truck. I'll take one for the team. But that's, that's one of the crazy stories we have. You know, this one may be a curveball for you, but uh, I just have to ask because it comes up. I'll see you post pictures right on Instagram. And you post a picture of, a, you know, some videos, some cut from this. Some, and then all of a sudden there's pictures of somewhat semi-half naked pictures of you what, what era of your life was this, and what's the story between these uh, semi-naked pictures that you have online? What do you mean? Nothing's on social media. These are pictures I took years ago. But some of them may be on posing, yes. There's probably going to be some of them that I'm posing. Uh, because back in 1999, I think I did a photo shoot March of 2000 at Marina Del Rey, okay? And some of the photo shoots was being done because of a direction I was going in my life with entertainment, and uh, we took those photos. But that was a long time ago. Matter of fact, I'll tell you a funny story. One time, I uh, uh, had a picture in my uh, uh, closet or something like that, and I asked uh, one of my uh, coworkers to go to my room and grab something, and they accidentally saw some of the pictures. They, obviously, they should have never seen the pictures that were sitting there. And let's just say the reactions were pretty exciting. I wish I had a video to record the reaction this person had. But yeah, there's some crazy pictures out there, but I have them. The world shouldn't have them. Me and my photographer have them. So what was your transition from leaving the military to going into sales? Because, you know, it, those are complete two different worlds. Where did the sales component come in? So when I got out of the military, I needed a job. So I called my sister. I said, I need a job. And she got me a job at uh, Bally Total Fitness. She got me an interview with Lanetta and Ophelia and Donnell. These three guys interviewed me, I got hired, I went to the training program, came back, they placed me at Culver City working with Cisco, and that's uh, when I got into sales. It was a slow start the first month, but then Cisco was patient with me, giving me the right direction. I was working with a good team, with Dexter, Molina, Rimmer, you know, Joe, Silvio. We had a great squad of guys to work with, and a, a big influence on my sales career started from uh, Culver City Valleys. Why don't people like sales, by the way? Why do you think people don't like sales? If you're selling a product you don't believe in, you're probably not going to like sales. But if you're selling a product you believe in, I guarantee it's going to be a different way you look at sales because you believe in the product. So think about whatever your favorite car is, whatever your favorite brand is, clothes is, and you've never sold before. If a person wants to go in sales, just make a list of what products you like. Then you want to get into sales, go sell that. You know, or uh, uh, you know, find somebody that you're working with. So one is the product, the other one is finding somebody you work with. Because sometimes sales managers, some of them are bad. And if you work for a bad sales manager who doesn't know how to get the best out of you and work you and challenge you and push you, sometimes you're not gonna do good. So it's either find products that you fully believe in to sell or it's find sales leaders 
that you can work closely with that can bring out the best in you and challenge you. You find those two, it's going to end up working out for you. You mean, you mean everything in life is sales? Everything in life is sales. Yes, everything is. So it doesn't matter if it's relationship, parenting, business, wanting a promotion, your girl, your boy, your husband, your wife, your parents, you know, every aspect of life is all selling. And if you show me anybody that's being left behind in a family, in a job for a promotion and anything, it's somebody that doesn't know how to sell, sell themselves. If you learn how to sell yourself and you deliver, you're probably going to have a better life than somebody that doesn't know how to sell themselves and they deliver. But you got to learn how to sell yourself. It gives you an upper advantage, a, you know, an unfair advantage in the marketplace when you know how to communicate a message and deliver it to people. Can you talk about your first sale? What was it like? When I was at Culver City Mall and I'm walking around trying to sell memberships and then she walks up and we start talking. She was so nice to me, a young, attractive girl. We started talking, she bought the membership. I called Cisco, I said, Cisco, I just sold my first membership. And I couldn't believe she said, yes, $75 down, $32 a month at the time. And that was the beginning of many more sales to be made. You ended up going to one of the worst locations in Bally's that wasn't performing that well, and then you turned it into one of the best performance gyms. What happened there? Yeah, so I got a call from Robbie Solomon saying you ought to go work at uh, Chatsworth Bally's. Now, Chatsworth, if you don't know where Chatsworth is, Chatsworth at the time produced 80% of all the porn around the world. So most of our customers were porn stars. Now, if you were a Chatsworth member, I'm not telling you were a porn star, but I'm telling you most of our customers were porn stars. So if you worked there, it was... <laughs> It was, uh, you had to learn how to communicate with the community because every market is how you talk to the community. It's, uh, selling memberships in Hollywood on El Centro was very different than selling memberships in Oxnard Valleys when it opened up versus the Valleys you sold in Culver City, then the one in Chatsworth. You can't speak the same language to the customers there. The demographic is different, so you got to learn to adjust and speak their language. But when I went there, the club was hitting 42%. When I left, it was 125% of the goals every single month because we worked on a script, we worked on the language, we worked on the culture, we walked around the club, we said hello to our guests, we shook hands with the guests, we spotted the guests, can I help you with this? And that created an environment where guests wanted to give us referrals. They would bring people in. Hey, my buddy also wants to be a member. I was telling him about you. Hey, my girlfriend wants to come. My mom and dad are here. And everybody started showing up because people were glad to be part of a gym that was incredible. Right across the street was a powerhouse gym, and that chat sport for that period was dominating the Leaders Bulletin. So for somebody that works as hard as you do, you're always you know, working, if you're following the stories, Instagram, you're at the office, you're doing stuff. How is it being married to somebody like you? What's it like to be married to me? So uh, I'm, you're gonna know I'm gonna work. You're gonna know I'm uh, building. If I'm not at the office, if I'm on the road, if I'm traveling, if I'm in meetings, I'm growing the business, you will know that part. And then when it's time with family, I enjoy my Sundays. And Sundays exclusive for my kids, my wife, for my family. I look forward to Sundays. And we're gonna have our date nights on Saturday nights. You're gonna see somebody that's gonna be working and you're also gonna see someone like the other day, my son will come here and we'll spend some time together. He'll run around and have fun. They're always at the office. They enjoy being here. I mean, we got slides here. We got video games here. We got ping pong here. We set up the gym in a way where kids also want to be here, right? So they're coming here regularly. And when they come, they can figure out a way to entertain, entertain themselves. One of the better things about being a business owner or entrepreneur is you get to dictate what kind of an environment you want to create where it's either family friendly or not. I decided to create a, a type of an environment that my kids are also going to enjoy coming here. So yes, I am still working very hard, if not harder today. You, you don't typically hear, you know, traditional thought is not husband and wife work together, right? I know you and your wife work together. She's in your company with you regularly. How is that dynamic of the two of you working together on a daily basis? Work, we never have issues when it comes to work because everybody knows their role. She's empowered. She's a VP of operations and she does a very good job as VP of operations. I'm very proud of her efforts. And then I'm the CEO. So at work, I'm not a husband. At work, I'm the CEO. At work, she's the VP of operations. So if you asked her, she would tell you, we've never had a conflict working with each other except for the first week when we tried to share an office together. And I'm on the phones for nine hours. If you can't handle me being on the phones for nine hours, you need your own office. So we got her own office. But outside of that, our challenges are not work-related. It's more We'll argue with uh, uh, off work, personal life, just like any other relationship, family, feud, challenges, kids, but we have zero issues when we work together. You know, it's interesting you say that. I, I sat down with Mark Demos, who he was from Seattle, and one of the things he was doing is he was working with a lot of these families 
from Amazon and Microsoft and the Templeton family and these billionaires and he would talk about what it was like to be the kids of a billionaire. Do you ever feel like, do you ever in your back of your mind, do you think about like maybe you're casting a shadow over your kids and it's going to be tough for them to want to overcome that? Does that ever cross your mind? Do I worry about casting a shadow on my kids? No, I don't worry about that at all. Although I don't know what it is for them. So I have to respect the fact that they may feel that way. But I'm not the one that's going to be telling them, you better become an entrepreneur because your daddy was an entrepreneur or this is a legacy business. One day you're going to run it. There is no plans of that. They have to tell me that they want to do that. It's got to be their choice because if it's their choice, they're going to give their best. If it's my choice, their choice, they're not going to give their best. So shadow to me is when somebody at the top is forcing you to do what they want you to do. There is no desire here of making my kids do whatever they want to do. Now, is there going to be an element of can I ever reach the level that my dad reached in his life? Because in life, there's nothing more annoying than a uh, great example. Nothing. When he got a great, my dad worked so hard, so it was always annoying to try to get in his shadow of hard work because it was like, this guy works so hard, man. He always says whatever he says he's going to do, he does it. Man, I feel like I have to meet that. But it worked here because I wanted to duplicate his example. So, but I do know there's going to be some of it and how they process that's going to be on them. But they're never going to get pressure from daddy to try to be daddy. They're going to get my uh, support to want to encourage them to pursue their dreams and it happens to be us work obviously ideally i'd love for us to run a business together but i can't make that happen they got to make that decision to happen for folks who consume your content it's constantly you got to go for it you got to work hard you got to stay focused you got to do this you know sometimes maybe for the audience it's kind of like oh my gosh do i have to be on all the time is it ever draining to be patrick but david no never not at all like when i tell you not at all i mean literally not at all because, I, because you have to realize, you know, when, when my wife and I made a decision to become entrepreneurs, we started a company and then four weeks later we get a massive lawsuit from a $400 billion company. And one day we're in bed and, you know, we're talking, hey, so was it the right decision, all this stuff. This was like six months into the business. And all my savings depleting, I'm all the way down to $13,000. She doesn't know it, but I know it. 12, 13 months into the business, you know, and it's like, oh my gosh, you know, look at the work, all this other stuff. What are we going to do? So look, this is what we signed up for. If it's what you signed up for, what do you mean draining? You chose this life. This is not a dictatorship where I was forced to live this life. I chose to live this life. If I chose to live this life, it is on me to make it work. So draining to me is if you were forced to do something that you never wanted to do in the first place. But if you chose to, it's on you to have a positive attitude to go make it work, not on anybody else. And I was never forced to. I chose to do this, and I'm glad I did and we did our best to make it work. Maybe let me rephrase this so it can, it can help out a little bit more. Is it tiring to always be on? Oh, I'm not always on. No, I mean, listen, the cameras are not always on me. I'm not always on. There's days that, uh, you know, uh, uh, I get upset or I'm frustrated at times, but maybe something didn't go my way or a deal fell through or, you know, someone's trying to do whatever they're doing, defamation of character deals, all this other stuff. You have to realize when a person decides to play it in the arena, take any of these athletes, if you don't like doing post-game interviews, you sign up for this. You have to do the post-game interviews. You have to do the media work. It's part of the work. So then don't go play for the NBA or MLB. You decided to do this. It's your choice. I decided to play ball and I wanted to be in the arena and this comes with it. So is it tiring sometimes? Yes. Are you sometimes going to feel like, oh my God, we gave our best and we got to recover? Absolutely. You know, are there days where you're not having the best of days? Yes. Uh, is there an element of being a human? 100%. But is it still exciting to get up the next day and start your day? I can't even tell you how exciting it is. I've probably not been this excited about start my days in my entire life as I am today. And it's not getting less, it's getting more exciting. And let me explain why. So it's not like one of these uh, uh, one-liners you say just to kind of uh, say it. Here's why. There are more unknowns in my life today than ever before. The more unknowns you have, positive unknowns, not negative unknowns. A negative unknown is what? Pending lawsuit. It's something you messed up with and it's pending, like you don't know what's going to happen. Those negative pending unknowns, they are draining, create anxiety, panic, a lot of that stuff. But when you got positive unknowns, I don't know what my sons are going to do. It's so exciting. I don't know what my daughter's going to be. Oh my gosh. I don't know what's going to happen with this business here. We're growing. That's exciting. I don't know what direction the media company's going. That's exciting. There are so many positive unknowns today 
that's like a gas tank just fueling you up throughout the entire day. That's, what's, that's what it feels like today with my life. The one episode you did, I think it's titled uh, 14 Strategies to Beat Goliath, right? And this Goliath is an enemy. It's like, oh, what if you're facing somebody that's bigger than you? Who are your current enemies that you're going up against? Who is my biggest enemy? As I came up uh, com competing, as I came up in the marketplace, there was always a target. You know, I'm going after this guy, or I'm going after this company, or I'm going after this person. Nothing creates more urgency for me than knowing and wanting to find out what my capacity looks like. So for example, I I imagine if, if I give my best, I can get to here, right? I wanna meet this guy. I can't live my life getting to here. So the enemy is this guy slowing me down to just celebrate what I currently have today. But I'm not interested in meeting this guy. I'm interested in meeting this guy. I want to meet this guy. I want to know what this guy's capable of doing. I want to know how this guy thinks. I want to know how this guy processes issues. I want to know how he looks at challenges or, you know, in every aspect of life, how to process uh, politics, parenting, marriage, kids, finance, economy, religion, sports. How do you process all of that? How do you, I want to talk to this guy. I want to meet this guy. So the enemy is anything and any spirit that prevents me from meeting this guy. That's the person I want to meet. If even I get in my way of meeting this guy, I'm gonna make sure I straighten that up because I don't even want myself, my victories, my current whatever accolades that I have to make me feel like, oh my gosh, you've already reached it. Look at the life you're living. No, I enjoy being in the arena. There is nothing more exciting than being in the arena. Then the idea is, which is what I'm doing, then it's on the arena, then it's to build many arenas, then to see how big you can scale it. It's the, the phases of life you're going to, right? So I'm excited about always the next phase. I, I would assume in the world of business, you know, for someone that's in it, you know, uh, uh, no businessman or businesswoman is undefeated. But you're gonna lose every once in a while. I wonder, how do you handle defeat or a loss? I will tell you, like for me, when something happens that's a setback or a defeat, I like to immediately get back into it again. Like, you know, the other, I'll give you a perfect example. The other day, I experienced a loss right? And it was uh, 9 o'clock at night, 10 o'clock at night on a Saturday night, right? I didn't like it. What I do? I came straight to the office. And I was here till 2.30 in the morning. And I woke up Sunday at 7.30. I still had my day with my kids. And all day I didn't take a nap, nothing. I was with them. But I chose to come here to the office. Why did I come here to the office? To map out my next moves. So to, to me, a defeat is got to have an element of getting back into the ring ASAP. I remember one time my son uh, there was an incident in the pool with uh, our kids where he fell in the pool and his sister fell in the pool and he panicked for his sister. We got the sister out, but he panicked for his sister. And from that moment on, he went in the house and my wife comes and the guy doesn't want to go in the pool. I said, that's not going to happen. He's got to go in the pool. He's not going in the pool. I said, he's going to go in the pool. He says, babe, I'm telling you, he's not going in the pool. He doesn't want to go outside to be by the And I know this kid loves to swim. I came and I said, let's go. He said, I'm not going. He says, hug me and let's go. He said, I'm not going. He says, let me make a promise to you. I will not ask you or drop you in the pool by yourself. I'm not going to do that. If you do this because you chose to do it, but hug me as hard as you want. So he hugs me. So let's go. He's crying the entire time we go in the pool. I'm in the pool. He's hugging me. And I said, look at me. Look at me. Look at me. He's looking at me. So don't panic. It's just a pool. You know how to do this. Nothing happened to your sister. You're okay. You like swimming. I don't like swimming. You love swimming. I see how you swim. I can't get you out of a pool. I scream to bring you out. So it's re-reminding him and processing everything with him. And then he's looking at me, I said, now I want you to go from hug me in the front to hug me in the back. So he hugs me in the back. Okay, now I'm gonna go underwater, we're gonna go together. And then we go underwater, we come up. Now I want you to come to the front. I said, I want you to hold my hands. I'm not gonna let go, just hold my hands and kick. He's kicking, he's kicking. It took me an hour and a half of doing this with him. An hour and a half later, I let go of my hands. He swam, but I'm right there, he came. We did this a few times. And then his brother came in and then he forgot about it and then he swam the rest of the day. But in that moment, if we don't face that defeat, that could affect him for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. It could affect him as a 24-year-old. Why would I do that to him? No. When you have a loss or a defeat, you gotta get back into the ring immediately. When I have him, I'm going straight to my ring. Because I get, gotta get back in there, get hit again to face it, or else the fear and imagination creates this bigger monster inside, and it stays in you and grows. I don't want that. You don't want that. So. 
you gotta face it immediately when it happens to you. At least that's what I do. You've referenced this concept of David versus Goliath. Again, that episode I talked about earlier you did, which is 14 strategies on how to be Goliath. It's always like this David Goliath, David Goliath. Maybe at the beginning stages you were a David, but some may look at you as a Goliath today. Who do you relate to more, David or Goliath? To some of the people that I went up against, I may be Goliath now to them, yes, but I don't see myself as Goliath. I think Goliath was uh, arrogant. Uh, you know, the reference to the story is arrogant, cocky, and didn't see anybody as a threat, and he thought he was untouchable. And David, to me, was more strategic. He looked at the other person's strengths and figured out a way to have an edge over the other person. I mean, it's constantly being David. Yeah, I'm sure there's other Davids that see me as a Goliath that they want to come after us and want to compete with us. More power to them. I encourage them to do that. But uh, I relate more to David than I do to Goliath. You've quoted Robert Greene from 33 Strategies of War. You've talked about Sun Tzu Art of War. You know, and there's a lot of different uh, strategies and techniques of doing certain things, but do you feel you've, uh, you're open to or you have shared all your strategies with everybody or are there some that we don't know about? Not all of them. You know, I mean, obviously, um, uh, you know, you're, you're sharing what you're sharing, what you're doing. It's great, yes, but few of them will be when I'm, you know, putting an event together at the vault or something like that where it's intimate and it's close. In the smaller setting, your biggest strategies are always going to be unveiled in smaller settings, not bigger settings. So if you are in a smaller setting, of course. Every single one of the guys that I work with who are in a group of five or two or three, anything, because we're on the same team together. But uh, if it's a bigger scale with everybody, not all of it. Smaller scale, all of it. So look, you often get criticized for, you know, content. If you follow the content in the comment section, why is he giving away all this content? In other, you know, online uh, gurus, they're selling this content for a couple thousand dollars, but he gives away, there's gotta be bigger motivation. Is there a scheme? Is, is there something you're doing with your, you know, intentions of giving away this content for free? I think scheme is a negative word. I don't know if I'm comfortable with the word scheme. If you're saying strategy, I can say yes, of course there is. I mean, absolutely there is. There is a strategy to the madness of attainment. But here's what it is gonna happen. Scheme to me is I win, you lose. Strategy to me is I win, you win. We're both winning together. So there's a very big long-term strategy with value attainment. I wish there was a value attainment when I was coming up because I wanted to go to a place where I can get this content. I didn't, I had to get it through books. So, YouTube has given us the opportunity to create content where somebody can watch this kind of stuff. So one is, I created a platform that I wanted when I was coming up. It's always, my mindset's always that. Remember how earlier I said, if I believe in the product, I can sell it? I look at what's missing and what I wish I had, and then I go build it. So that's valuetainment. And I believe people learn better if there's an aspect of entertainment to it, right? Not just an aspect of value. Value by itself is boring. So value with entertainment becomes valuetainment, right? The great thing about online gurus is you can uh, go out there and create content and if your message resonates with people, you know, more power to them, okay? Uh, I like folks who have built a business before and we will touch topics on valuetainment that people think about but they don't want to talk about. I mean, sometimes we'll cross the line with politics. There's a lot of people that are frightened of talking about politics. You know, what if they lose an audience? What if somebody says something? What if somebody disagrees with them, right? But at the same time, I'm speaking and creating content on topics that people are thinking about, and I'm trying to give a different perspective. So whatever these online gurus want to do, if they're solving for selling more courses, if they're solving for selling more products, and that's their main outcome, yes, I understand their strategy, but that's not our outcome. Obviously, there's a vision. There's a long-term goal and what we want to do, and uh, this is just one aspect of what our long-term goal is with media that we're trying to do. And so that's why I create content the way I do. The topic of trust is always being talked about on Valuetainment. You're regularly talking about who to trust, levels of trust, you know, seven ways to know if you can trust somebody or not. Do you feel like you're someone that's easy for you to trust other people or is it tougher for you to trust folks? Look, it's kind of like being 18 years old and you go to apply for the first credit card, right? You're, what's your credit score when you're 18 years old and you've never used your credit? Your credit is typically a 720 because the, the FICA formula is give everybody the best. Got it. Give them the benefit of the doubt. You all start with a 720. Not an 820, but at least a 720. And then from there, the credit bureau determines whether you drop off, you didn't make your car payment, you didn't make your credit card payment on time, 
and your credit score goes from a 720 to a 680 to a 620 to a 580, now everybody knows you're not disciplined. And now bank's not gonna give you a million dollar loan or half a million dollar loan or a $100,000 car loan because everyone knows your credibility score now, right? Or you get your 720, you get a car, you make the payment on time, good. You got a second car, you made the payment on time, now you're 740. You bought a house for three years, you made the payment on time, now your credit score is 778. Now we know who you are, but we started you at 720. Very similar formula. Everybody who works, they have a certain level of score that they've given the benefit of the doubt. And at that point, either you build on it or you take points away. That's pretty much exactly how I run it when I'm working with folks on my team. You know, when I watch your content on YouTube and if I follow you on Instagram, I see you posting stuff, pranks. You know, you got the, one of your editors singing, you got Mario doing stuff, you got, you know, there's, there's almost like a fun side. So I wonder, what is your tactic for handling pressure especially the fact that you're running the business, the, wife, the family, the kids, the investors, all this stuff. How do you manage the pressure in your life? You know, honestly, how I handle pressure is humor and pranks. If you are not, la listen, just watch Jordan. If you watch Jordan, you would have seen that one of the great things about him was behind closed doors, the guy was about pranks, he was about fun, he was about jokes, he was about laughter. Any kind of pressure type situation, you have to relieve it by having a lot of humor and funny things that happen. If you don't, you can't manage. Military, when you're sitting around and you don't have a lot of things to look forward to, this is when you hear jokes, this is when you hear laughter, this is when people are telling each other stories, funny stories. Because uh, laughter and pranks and humor tends to bring pressure down. You need humor, humor's a big part of pressure. You're on the other side, like, meaning you create the content and, and you know millions of people watch it and consume it and whether you motivate them, I know you don't like to be called a motivational, but you, you sometimes motivate people, you inspire them or you give them strategies, but who's motivating the motivator? Where do you get to get your content to be motivated? You gotta figure out a way to have something feed you. Because if you're not fe being fed, you're gonna be empty. It doesn't matter how uh, uh, much of a peak performer you are, you gotta find a source of you being fed. Books, relationship, mentors, advisors, counsel, for somebody to give you encouragement, you need to be able to do that. Because if you don't, then eventually you're gonna be drained yourself. This is why you hear even a high performing athlete goes and pays $400,000 a year to have somebody mentally and emotionally keep him stable. There's a reason for doing that. This is a guy that's made it to the highest level. Why does he need somebody? Of course he needs somebody. Just because you made it to the highest level doesn't mean you don't also need to have somebody motivate you or work with you or give you clarity. So yes, I'm a, I'm a big uh, uh, believer of having somebody that's driving you as well. You've mentioned many times different people that have influenced you a lot in your lives, but if we were just to kind of get it out there in the open so we can all find out. Who would you say are some of the folks that influence you the most in your life? These guys in the back, um, the paintings, whether it's MLK, Milton Friedman, Shaw, Senna, Tupac, Lincoln, JFK, Einstein, they influence me tremendously. And a lot of the faces that you see in here, these three different personalities and element of each within me, whether it's the Hulk, Batman, or Joker, or uh, Jordan, Kobe, Brady, Tyson, anybody that goes above and beyond influences me. Their method of madness to how they wanted to compete when they went up against their opponent, I relate to a lot. You tell the story about how you started the channel. First, it was called Patrick Bed David, right? And it was like two minutes with Pat, motivational videos. And then you go and change the channels into value team and you start doing entrepreneurship. And pretty much the channel becomes a number one channel on YouTube for entrepreneurs. But then, you know, you've been doing a lot of bodybuilding interviews and a lot of you know, mobsters and mafias, you know, is this still the focus to be the number one channel on YouTube for entrepreneurs? Or are you trying to be the number one channel on YouTube for mobsters or bodybuilding? Where, where, is, where is this going? Of course it's the channel for entrepreneurs. It just so happens we've been interviewing a lot of mobsters. So Value Tema right now has probably four audiences. One is uh, folks in the fitness world, bodybuilders. Another one is uh, those who uh, enjoy the mob stories, whether it's uh, you know, Sammy DeBull Gravano or Frank Collada or Oscar Goodman or Michael Francis or whoever else may be. And then you have folks who are in the entrepreneur space and then some that are into politics. But uh, it, it's really, for, it's so funny because I'll run into people at the airport or at different places and they'll say, I follow Value Taman because of the entrepreneur content. I follow all the mob interviews. I follow all the bodybuilding interviews. I follow, so there's different audiences for it. Originally it was one dimensional, it was just entrepreneur. Today we've been able to do more. That part wasn't intentional. It's just levels of interest, things that I know about that draws the audience and maybe it's the questions that are being asked that's leading them to want to know 
uh, uh, more about the guests that we're having. The guests you've had, they're from, they're from all walks of life. Whether it's, uh, I think you sat down with uh, General Spaulding, I think he was an Air Force general and he had some insider information to share with us on China and the relationship with U.S. or Kevin Hart or even Sammy Dubo Gravano where he sat down and did the interview with you and you opened up or even Kobe Bryant, you were one of the last ones to interview Kobe Bryant. What do you take away from all of these stories when you sit down and talk to them? I mean, obviously, it's a different perspective for the viewer, but how are you processing all these guests that you're sitting down with? It's hearing their story and uh, uh, seeing similarities between uh, uh, what led them to become who they are. Like, what I'm looking for is to see what made a Sammy become Sammy and what made a Kevin Hart become Kevin Hart. What made General Spalding have the opinion that he has on China. I'm curious about that when he lived in China for three years. What did he learn about China? And then obviously Kobe Bryant is a guy that I followed from the day he came into uh, the NBA when he got traded for Vlade Divac. I'm, I'm a diehard Lakers fan. So at that time when we got him, it was just a beautiful thing because him and Shaq running together was a beautiful thing. That's one that uh, we will appreciate for the rest of our lives because not only did I grow up with uh, Kobe, Kobe and I are six weeks apart and we were uh, uh, establishing a relationship together as a guy that he's a competitor and him and I, the, some of the conversations we had off camera were uh, 10 times better than the conversations we had in the interview. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one that uh, my wife and my kids still talk about regularly, you know, when it's with Kobe. But the main thing is what got the person to become who they are today. And if there was a tweak that was made in that moment, could they have gone in a different direction? We would have known their stories, either for positive or a good. Could there have been an opportunity for us to prevent a Sammy from becoming, from happening? Could, could an inspiration or somebody giving him better direction had Sammy go a completely different route? So every one of them has a different story, but you're trying to find out what, led, uh, what caused them to become the way they are today. Valuetainment to me is a lot of your philosophies being shared with the rest of the world, right? So it's kind of like you believe this or you believe that, but there's a lot of different ones. Do you have a core philosophy or core philosophies that you live by? Like one? Yeah. I don't know if I have one. I think I have many. Now, obviously, whatever I teach my kids, lead, respect, and prove love. But I think within that is a lot of my philosophies. If I were to put the biggest one in there, you know, I would say rule of threes is big for me. Anything you do three times, you know how to do. If you've been able to make $100,000 three years in a row, you know how to make $100,000 your fourth year, okay? If you've made three sales that each paid you $10,000, you know how to do it the fourth time. You didn't get lucky. But if you made a sale only one time and you got $100,000, you've never done it again, you probably got lucky. If you've done anything one time, it's luck. If you do it three times, it's great. So I produce, that generates confidence for an individual to be thinking about saying, you've done this three times, guess what? I'm not an amateur, I know how to do it the fourth time. And then the other part is that uh, I look at all my data and whatever data I have, I try to beat whatever data I have currently today. So if I did something and our biggest month ever was 300 policies we sold in a month, my goal is to do 400 policies in a month. I don't say, oh, that guy's doing 3,000, I'm at 300, my God, I can't beat this guy, so I'm discouraged. No, I'm not trying to beat that guy right now, I'm trying to beat 300 to go to 400, to go to 500, to go to 600. We started off selling 50 policies a month. Today, you know, last month we sold 6,654 policies in a month because we went from 50 to 100, 100 to 200, 200 to 400, and we brought it up. So, you know, Rule of threes and constantly beating your prior best. I remember, I don't know how long ago it was, maybe it was two or three years ago. I, again, I don't know the number. I do remember you did shut down the channel by attainment for three months. And the plan was to maybe not even come back. And it kind of concerned some people. Obviously, you got a lot of comments about people being upset with the fact that the channel was shutting down. Is this, are you going to create content forever? Or are we again going to get a ch time or a moment where you decide to suddenly shut down the channel? I don't know how long, um, how much longer I'll be creating content, but value tame is going to be around for quite some time. But me creating new content, I don't know how long that's going to be around. You know, it's crazy to say this, but uh, when we first started, you know, I had no idea what direction we we're going to go. Obviously, there's some things I like that you say and some things I, I don't like that you say, but this is going to sound weird. I see a lot of me and you, and I, I just relate to you. I don't know what it is. I feel like we have a, a lot in common, but ha having said that, I know you've written many books. I know you got a book coming out. Can you tell us a little bit, give us a sneak peek of this new book that you have coming out with Simon & Schuster. 
this is a book I've been looking forward to uh, coming out for a while. We've been working on it for a good three or four years. And it's a book I wish I would have had when I was coming up. E even if it's 18 years old or 21, even though it's tailored for C-suite executives and entrepreneurs, it's about you knowing your next five moves, no matter what aspect of your life and no matter what phase of your life you're at. If you look at a chess player, right, a grandmaster is somebody that typically you'll say, they'll say he or she knows their next 10 or 15 moves right so as they're playing you they already know what they're gonna be doing to you based on whatever you'll be doing right in life it's the same thing I'm gonna be making this move now that's gonna lead to this one then this one then that one right because many times you'll see people that are trying to do move number 28 on move number three and that's why they don't get to move 28 because they're trying to do it too early and when you do it too early you're not creating the necessary sequence to get to 28 and uh, also on top of that with this book, Your Next Five, uh, um, uh, Your Next Five Moves, is uh, something that as you go through it, you're going to learn. There's a whole section in the book about uh, how to put the right team together. And there's a whole section in the book about power plays. Mm -hmm. the, the world of business and life is a lot of power plays. If you don't know the right power plays, others will be playing the power plays on you. So there's that section that people will read, which I can't wait to get uh, 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 folks to go through. But yeah, again, a book I wrote that I wish I would have had years ago when I was first getting started in business. Look, I can make one commitment for you. Here's a commitment I'm going to make to you in, in front of everybody. This is a commitment I'll make to you. I guarantee you no one's going to promote your book more than I will. That's a commitment I'm making to you right now on camera. It's on camera. I'm telling you right now, I'm committing to uh, moving a lot of your books. And by the way, obviously we're getting to the end of the interview. If you have any thoughts and, and if you have any comments, we're going to put his Twitter handle where you can send him a tweet or you can send me a tweet as well what you took away from this interview. But for final thoughts, and we'll put the link of the book below as well if you want to go find out more about the book. Final thoughts. You talk about this book being uh, your next five moves. I think it's fair to finish on this note is what are your next five moves? That's a good question. My next five moves are...